So I'll begin today by talking about uh, the Cameo Research Program that I come from. I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia, where we have the Cameo Research Program. It stands for Complementary Medicine Education and Outcomes Program. And it's a collaborative research program housed at the BC Cancer Agency in Vancouver, which is a collaborative initiative between the UBC School of Nursing and the BC Cancer Agency. We like to think of ourselves as a living laboratory focused on bringing the current evidence around complementary medicine to patients, healthcare providers, and uh, the community to help people make safe and informed decisions around complementary medicine in the context of cancer. Our goal is really about supporting patients, increasing patient autonomy versus offering specific recommendations or therapies because that's a very important decision you need to make with your healthcare providers and your family that's very focused on your own preferences, needs and goals. Just a quick introduction of our Cameo Research team. We're all housed in Vancouver. Uh, they're nurses, epidemiologists, CAM researchers, and Dr. Maria Verhoff, who is the Canadian CHR Chair in Complementary Medicine, right here, is actually an epidemiologist here at the University of Calgary in the School of uh, Community Medicine. Just to acknowledge our funders, the Lottie and John Heck Memorial Foundation, the Canadian Institute of Health Research for two of our researchers, Dr. Linda Balnese and Dr. Maria Verhoff, and the Canadian Breast Cancer Research Alliance. So in the next 20 minutes, we'll do a quick overview of what is CAM, and we'll talk about what that means. We'll have a focused look at the evidence around complementary medicine in general, and then how it relates to kidney cancer. And then I will leave, we'll finish off with some tips on being a savvy consumer of complementary medicine. And then of course the questions and discussion will be at the very end of the afternoon with the panel discussion. So starting off, what do we mean by CAM? Well, CAM usually stands for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine in the U.S. through the National Institutes of Health define it as a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices and products that are not presently considered to be a part of conventional medicine. And they divide it into five kinds of categories, body-based things like massage, mind-body therapies such as meditation, relaxation, visualization, biologically based things like herbs, supplements, nutritional supplements, energy-based uh, systems like acupuncture, Reiki, therapeutic touch, and whole medical systems are things like naturopathy, traditional Chinese medicine, and Ayurvedic medicine. We can further define CAM into kind of three different areas of, of complement, complementary medicine, alternative medicine, and integrative medicine. So complementary medicine are those things that people do in addition to conventional treatment like chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. Alternative medicine, on the other hand, is that four to six percent of people who leave conventional medicine, so they leave chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, to seek some other form of treatment um, that hasn't been yet found to be as effective as complementary medicine, as con conventional medicine. And then what we're trying to work towards, hopefully in my lifetime, is integrative medicine. And that's where we combine, the patient and the family are in the center, and we combine conventional medicine, so chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, along with the best evidence around complementary medicine, and we bring them together to help meet the patient's goals in addition to their, their medical treatment plan. So for the rest of the talk, I'm, when I say CAM, I'm really talking about complementary medicine, those things people do in addition to conventional medicine to achieve some sort of personal goal. So we know that uh, CAM is very popular. The research shows us that up to 80% of Canadians with cancer actually use some form of complementary medicine from the time of diagnosis while they're living with, through, and beyond cancer. It's most commonly used in women, uh, sort of in that uh, young to mid-age range, who generally have a higher income. And we know that a great deal of money is spent out of pocket uh, for CAM therapies because they're generally not covered by our, our uh, health care system. But even though it's quite popular and people are doing it, most patients don't talk to their health care provider about complementary medicine. 
You may have had this experience where you feel you're interested in a CAM therapy, you try to talk to your, your health care provider, but they just don't feel like they have the knowledge or skill to be talking about that. Or you might feel um, maybe a bit embarrassed to bring it up, that maybe uh, this is something that you shouldn't be doing, um, or that simply it's, it's just not within your health care provider's scope of practice. Maybe the questions you have about complementary medicine are actually better addressed by a naturopath or a traditional Chinese medicine doctor. But when we don't talk about complementary medicine with our oncologists and our nurses and our other oncology health care providers, there's, there could be some safety concerns. Um, for example, there's many natural health products that can actually make um, side effects from conventional therapy worse, or it could undo the effects of conventional therapy if they're used inappropriately together. But at the same time, when we don't talk about complementary medicine, we could be missing out on some really important beneficial CAM therapies for which evidence actually exists. And if we don't open the dialogue, then the opportunity to learn about these CAM therapies may not be um, a part of your treatment plan. So many patients come to our CAMIA research program feeling lost and confused. They are wondering about how to talk about complementary medicine. They're looking for some evidence-based therapies that may help improve their symptoms, uh, increase their time to progression, or potentially prolong their cure. So what we do at the uh, cameo research program is we help people make safe and informed decisions. We like to call them those good decisions. So we have to stop and think, well, what does a good decision really mean? Well, it involves taking the evidence around a CAM therapy, so the science behind that, as one part of our decision, but also considering who you are. What are your beliefs, values, and goals? What are you trying to achieve? What fits for you as a person? Who's in your social network? Because we know we don't make decisions about anything in our lives, and nonetheless, complementary medicine uh, in, in isolation. We have a social network around us that helps us. Who are those people in your network that can help you make these decisions, find the evidence, and actually use the CAM therapies? And not to forget our, our clinicians, our oncologists, nurses, pharmacists, nutritionists, they have a very important role to play as well. While they may not have expert knowledge about a particular CAM therapy, they can help you access the information, talk about what it means for you as an individual, the risks and benefits given your type of cancer, the treatment you're on, and to bring all of these things together so that your decision to use complementary medicine is actually an informed one. So what do we mean by evidence? Um, Many of you may be familiar with the evidence pyramid here, where we have test tube, trying to get this right here, test tube research on the bottom, where most of our, our ideas about how to solicit a cure for cancer or how to address symptoms begins in the test tube. And as we work up the evidence pyramid, we get to the top where the best quality of evidence actually exists. This is where most of our conventional chemotherapy, radiation, and surgical treatments come from when we've actually gone from a test tube, a cellular level, for example, maybe we're looking at a natural health product in a test tube, it's then found to affect in the test tube. We try it on animals. Does it work on mice or, or, or other animals? Does it actually shrink tumors in mice? Then we continue to move up. There's case reports. Then we have series of cases. We get to case control cohort studies where we see uh, an effect in a population of patients, but we're not really sure if it's the natural health product making the difference. Then we can actually control in terms of clinical trials, seeing if in one, one group it actually makes a difference versus not. And then when we put a bunch of clinical trials together, we actually can have a meta-analysis or a synthesis of, of research together. And this is where we would like to make our decisions about the best evidence around complementary medicine. But unfortunately, most complementary medicine research is still in its infancy down in this area. And that's not a bad thing. It's just important to acknowledge. It's got to start somewhere. And as time progresses and we have more clinical trials, we'll continue to move up to the top here where we can actually make recommendations about particular CAM therapies. So what's wrong with the mouse? What's wrong with uh, testing uh, a CAM therapy in a mouse? Well, there's nothing. Um, 
It's important when you're looking at evidence, if, you, if you're looking at a particular natural health product that's been tested in a mouse and it's shrunk a tumor in a mouse, it's important to acknowledge that they, that may not therefore translate into someone, a human with kidney cancer, because there's the big step between uh, generalizing findings from a mouse to a person uh, who has a particular kind of cancer. Now, having said that the research is in its infancy, there actually has been two really important documents that have been helpful for us that have synthesized the best evidence that exists so far about complementary medicine. The Society for Integrative Oncology, the SIO, um, has created clinical practice guidelines around complementary therapies and botanicals, and that's led by Gary Dang out of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Uh, it's a fairly conservative kind of approach, and I'll just show you a little summary in a minute about particular CAM therapies that are recommended, caution, and not recommended. And then, not to forget the role of diet, exercise, and nutrition in, as a particular CAM therapy. There's a very important uh, report there um, that as a whole world synthesis around recommendations for cancer prevention and cancer survivorship related to nutrition, diet, and lifestyle. So I'll just quickly summarize both of those um, documents. So this is the Society for Integrative Oncology uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines. And you can see the green on the left of the therapies they've recommended, starting with the mind-body therapies. Sorry, are you having trouble hearing me? Move here. OK, thank you. So visualization, meditation, relaxation, biofeedback, and prayer all have been shown to have very beneficial effects in improving quality of life and reducing symptoms in cancer patients. Body-based therapies like massage, exercise, and diet, energy-based therapies like acupuncture, Reiki, and therape therapeutic touch. Now, there are some com com cautions when we get to acupuncture. Of course, if you're on treatments that actually interfere with the ability of the blood to clot, then you want to be do doing acupuncture with someone who is aware of this um, and that is taking some caution around that. And then it's not recommended uh, wristbands for na nausea and vomiting, the ones that involve electrical stimulation. Uh, the wristbands themselves are fine as long as they don't actually have electricity going through them. Natural health products. Now, that's a category where there's, uh, you know, four to 6,000 out there in the natural health product directorate trying to be labeled in terms of safety. So, of course, we can't make a recommendation on, on natural health products uh, so broadly. We have to evaluate each one of them individually for potential side effects and interactions with any other drug treatments that you're on. But it's generally recommended that natural health products not be used while you're on chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and before surgery, because they can interfere with uh, a variety of things like blood clotting. Now, there is one exception, uh, vitamin D. I suspect many of you in the room will be taking vitamin D because of the Canadian Cancer Society recommendation in 2007 to say that every Canadian should be taking 1,000 international units of vitamin D3 during the fall and winter months uh, for cancer prevention. Uh, now, they are revisiting that. They're doing another big synthesis, looking at the optimal dose may actually be raised this year to be closer to 2,000. And we're just watching uh, the Canadian Cancer Society for that recommendation. And we know every day we hear in the, in the news the role of vitamin D uh, and its effect in other chronic illnesses. It has cardiovascular effects, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. So that's definitely one to watch. Now, when you're using natural health products, there's things to consider. Um, many natural health products have hormonal effects. Uh, they have estrogenic effects. So if you were to have a cancer um, or be at risk for a cancer with hormonal effects, you may, not, you may want to look at things like black hole cosh, flaxseed, red clover. Now, these are just examples. There's many other examples out there. Many natural health products have brought blood thinning properties, alfalfa, chamomile, garlic, red clover, particularly when they're used together, um, we can see uh, reduced levels of blood clotting in patients. Many natural health products actually directly injure the liver and interfere with the breakdown of drugs in, through your liver. So if you're on chemotherapy and taking some natural health products, it can actually interfere with your body's ability to actually manage the chemotherapy radiation. 
We also know it also affects um, the, uh, cellular, at the cellular level how drugs are metabolized. So, um, there's a cellular mechanism that involves the cytochrome P450 pump, and it's kind of a pump that works all the time. And your chemotherapy uh, is based on how well this pump actually is working in your body. Now, you can take some natural health products that actually speed up or reduce that pump in your body. So you can actually excrete uh, chemotherapy and other helpful drugs out of your body more quickly or keep them on board longer, which can actually either reduce the effectiveness of the chemotherapy or um, make side effects worse. And of course, natural health products are just like any other drug. You can have allergies, upset stomach, insomnia, and changes in blood test values. So you really want to be uh, open and talking with your oncologist and your pharmacist in particular to talk about those natural health products you're considering before you actually engage in that. Who's heard of antioxidants? <laughs> I bet everyone in the room's heard of antioxidants. It's everywhere. It's in the face cream I used this morning. I don't know why it's there, but generally it's thought that our environment and as we age, our cells um, produce free radicals. And antioxidants, green tea, vitamins A, C, E, um, a variety of other things can actually scavenge those free radicals and help our cells repair and keep us young and healthy. Now when you're on treatment, some chemotherapy actually can um, cause free radicals. What we want the chemotherapy to do is to actually cause free radicals and it goes on to help kill other cells. So we don't want to scavenge those cells and put them back. So if you're taking high dose antioxidants in supplement forms, I'm not talking about eating berries, which have great antioxidant effects, but supplements in, in uh, like pill form, it can actually undo the effects of your chemotherapy. So you want to be really careful about using antioxidants while you're on treatment and for sure talk to your oncologist before you do that. Now people say to me, you know, that was kind of the no section of the presentation. There's lots of cautions about natural health products. What can I do um, to get those beneficial uh, nutritional effects that may help me uh, live longer and prevent a recurrence? Well, the uh, Food, Nutrition and Physical Activity and the Prevention of Cancer report actually sort of outlines those things that Brian pointed out this morning are the things that your mother told you when you were young, how to live a, a long and healthy life. This is a, na uh, a world view of research around uh, cancer prevention related to diet, activity, and lifestyle. And they're basically saying, uh, be as active as you can, with, uh, be as lean as you can, eat a variety of fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes, limit your red meat, particularly no processed meats, because we know it's related to, for example, the development of colorectal cancer. Alcoholic drinks, there's a limit per day. Two for, men, two for men, one for women, and you can't save them up for the weekend. It doesn't work that way. Limiting salty foods and foods processed with salt. One of the key recommendations is to meet your nutritional needs through diet alone. Try to aim to eat your nutrition through your food as opposed to taking it in supplement form. And I know our nutritionist will be, say <laughs> be saying more about this uh, later on. Um, there's a recommendation around breastfeeding. And here's an interesting point. Although these are cancer prevention guidelines, generally for people who have not yet developed cancer, the recommendations are that after treatment, cancer survivors should follow these prevention guidelines to help prevent a recurrence or a secondary cancer. People also say to us, so what kinds of foods have those phytonutrients that I really should be eating? And here's a list right out of that World Cancer Report that suggests you should be eating lots of berries who have antioxidants, Brazil nuts have selenium, uh, citrus fruits, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, cauliflower, fish for its omega-3 fatty acids, flax for its omegas and lignans, legumes, peas, beans, and lentils, tea for its flavonoid and other effects, tomatoes for its um, lycopenes, yogurt for its probiotic effect, and vegetables, the darker, the more colorful, the more nutrition and phytonutrients it has. And if you want to look at any of this information in more detail, there's a website there. And I'm going to actually give you a link to all of these websites uh, when we get to our, our cameo section. And 
In our cameo research program, we did a big overview of the kinds of cam therapies people were interested in in Vancouver. And we did a huge survey. And what I did for today is I looked at, for the patients who indicated they had kidney cancer, what were the top three CAM therapies that they were interested in learning more about? And they happened to be IV vitamin C, acupuncture, and Hai Sheng Su. And I'll give you a little evidence review of those three CAM therapies, what the science says about those uh, as of this month. So IV vitamin C. What is it? We know it's a soluble vitamin, so that if you take it orally, uh, there's only a certain dose that your body can use, and then you pee it out. So basically, IV vitamin C uh, is, is the route to get the therapeutic levels uh, as high as we can. Now, it is an antioxidant, so we want to be cautious about using it while on treatment. There's potential interactive effects there. It has a variety of helpful effects. There is some research that says if high doses of IV vitamin C are taken with vitamin E, it may increase the risk of MI or myocardial infarction, heart attack. The evidence. The evidence is not all that convincing when you really look at it. There's only been three case studies that show uh, some patients with advanced cancer lived uh, longer than expected. And remember, case studies are only in the middle of our evidence pyramid. They're not at the very top. Uh, there's been an early phase one trial that showed that it was tolerated pretty well, but there was no anti-cancer effects. It may actually interfere with some of cancer drugs. And it hasn't been specifically tested in kidney cancer. And it does have some pretty significant side effects related to its effects on the kidney in terms of kidney stones, renal problems, uh, affecting blood sugar, blood, uh, blood pressure. So this is not likely a therapy that's going to be helpful during kidney cancer. But it was definitely one of the ones patients were interested in. Acupuncture is a different story. This is, is a CAM therapy for which there has been a plethora, a waterfall of research. Uh, and it definitely has some beneficial effects. Many of you ha may have uh, been using acupuncture for its positive health benefits. Uh, if you're not aware of what it is, it's the use of very thin needles applied uh, throughout the body meridians. The idea is to regulate the flow of chi or the vital energy in our bodies. It actually releases neurotransmitters. It affects our pituitary gland and it changes functions in the part of our brain and it affects blood pressure, our immune system, and it releases endorphins. And there's a caution about using acupuncture in patients where blood platelets are low uh, or white cells are low. Uh, the evidence tells us it's highly recommended. Uh, very strong evidence around poorly controlled pain, nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy or surgery. Uh, the acupressure wristbands on the day of chemotherapy have been helpful for nausea and vomiting. For people experiencing hot flashes, there has been some positive benefits there. And radiation-induced dry mouth has had positive effects with acupuncture. There is beginning research that's been shown to be positive around shortness of breath, fatigue, and neuropathy. So the numbness and tinglings that you get in your hands and your feet. And more research is happening uh, every single day around acupuncture. Hai Sheng Su. I'd never heard of this before, and I really had to look, do a very close PubMed search to look. It's a common seashell from China, used in traditional Chinese medicine. In, in Vancouver, we have a very high population of Chinese-speaking patients, and I think this came with them uh, as a popular camp therapy they used in their own healthcare system. Uh, it has some antiplatelet, anti-tumor, and some enhanced immune function in the studies that I could find. But there's very limited English language uh, research on this particular therapy. It looks like doctors Liu and Li and Liu were the only ones who studied this in China. So the interpretation has been very challenging. We really don't know about how well, how it's absorbed in the body or whether it's an antioxidant, does it have a moral, hormonal effects or other properties. There was one really small trial uh, for renal cell patients. Uh, and they used it in addition to some immune therapies, and it showed increased remission rates and fewer GI side effects. But we're not really sure about the mechanism of that or uh, the quality of that study. It's also been studied in lung cancer and some other ascites tumors. Uh, so that would be one really low on the bottom of the evidence pyramid. Still more research needs to be done to, to show the benefit there. If you're interested in looking at clinical trials related to complementary medicine, you can 
search clinicaltrials.gov. I tried to look for kidney cancer and complementary medicine. Nothing came up. It's quite under-researched. I looked at solid tumor, and these, this is just an example of some that came up. My favorite at the bottom, white wine versus nutritional supplements and improving appetite in cancer patients. Let's go for that one. Just to finish off quickly, tips on being a savvy consumer of complementary medicine. The very first step is to identify what is your goal. Everyone has different goals for using complementary medicine, and the evidence uh, doesn't necessarily support all of your goals. And what your aunt used for uh, her breast cancer may not, in fact, be the same kind of therapy you want to use for your kidney cancer. You want to narrow it down to a few CAM options. I'm sure many of you have started out your search related to complementary medicine and felt overwhelmed and didn't know where to go. It's really important to try to get down to a couple and then locate credible sources of information. And I'm going to give you some more, just a couple more slides on that in a minute about how to do that really easily. Use your social network. People always want to help. You may uh, get people searching for information for you, figuring out where you can ac access a CAM therapy in your uh, community, just people to help you use your CAM. And then really important, once you've made a decision, to monitor your CAM use. Set a goal for yourself. You're, you've chosen to use a particular CAM therapy for a particular goal. When are you going to evaluate that? How are you going to know it's working? How are you going to know that it's, it may be hurting you? Just get a plan in place and evaluate it. At the Cameo Research Program, we've tried very hard to create a really great website that anybody can access uh, around the world to have credible links to information around complementary medicine. This is the website here. It's actually in your handout as well. If you go there and look at useful links here, it will link you to my three favorite credible CAM websites. The first one, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Herbs and Botanical Database. Fantastic, uh, patient-focused review of almost every type of CAM therapy, natural health product and botanical that you're looking for. The second one is the Natural Medicines Comprehensive Database. That's available online as well, and it you know, your physicians use something called the CPS, the drug manual for conventional medicine. This is the drug manual for natural health products. Um, you can access it through your pharmacist, your oncologist, your healthcare providers will have access to this, and probably your medical libraries will as well. And you can look, there's any uh, natural health product available to look up the evidence on that. Now, for things that are newer, um, that haven't quite made it into those two first databases, we, we do PubMed searches. So that's uh, an electronic database where you can actually look at new and emerging research that has been published around CAM therapies. Of course, our Cameo program, if you want to look on our website, I won't go over it in great detail because I'm running out of time. There's programs and resources available right now for people in British Columbia. Now we are expanding that. We've just uh, had word that we're going to be funded for another four years and we're trying to expand it nationally so that we're more visible and available across the country. So just to wrap up, the key questions to ask yourself. Does the CAM therapy you're considering, does it work? What's the evidence? Will it meet my personal goal? Do those two things match? We also have to consider safety. What are the benefits and the risks? Will it in interact with my cancer, my cancer treatment, or any other medical conditions I may have? What's the plan? How long am I going to use this CAM therapy? What are the outcomes or side effects I should expect, and how should I monitor that? And really important to consider, can I afford the time, the money, and the effort? These things are expensive and often involve lots of effort to use. And really, is it a healthy choice and balance in my life? The bottom line, CAM research is at the beginning stage. It's always changes, changing. You need to stay current. Consider the risks and benefits as well as potential for you and your family. Share your CAM use with your conventional health care providers and seek advice when needed. And most importantly, respect your own beliefs and values and keep a healthy, healthy balance in your choices. So thank you.